Uh, yeah, we have a question from Debbie who is wondering, what does Foster think about the future of AI and crypto? Oh, wow. We, we, <laughs> I was just having a great discussion with Lander on this just before we, before we came on. It is such an exciting topic to me. And I, you know, I'm an advisor to about eight different startup projects, and about half of them are in the AI space. So I'm kept up to date pretty much by very knowledgeable people. Uh, and Leandro is also a super knowledgeable person. So in terms of expertise, I'll refer you to him. But what I was saying to him before we came on is that what I'm most excited about is that AI used well is so powerful that the, the, the first two uses of AI, and one of the companies that I'm working with is focusing on these two things, it is the enc encryption of data so that when you create a video or you create a, a document or something like that, that it, AI will immediately encrypt it only under your control before it ever goes to Microsoft and Word, before it ever goes to Google, before it ever goes you know, onto the internet to be transmitted. You've already claimed your data. And by the way, that data is what the you know the the ai companies treasure so in the future people will have the option to sell their data to these companies right now they're they're just confiscating it for free without most people even knowing and then they are charging billions for it on the the data market so those billions could be going into individuals pockets on a voluntary basis if you choose to sell you whatever aspect of your data and then that can be a an ethical replacement for this whole ridiculous notion of universal basic income which sounds great oh wow everybody's going to have a you know a, a check in the mail so that they don't have to worry about this and that yeah where's that money going to come from and who's going to be in charge of stealing it from other people? You know, it's, it's just another scam for redistribution of your money. And they would keep everybody, you know, poor and sick and all that stuff through the money as well as they're doing on everything else. So back to the main point, which is, is that AI can really help people who are, are sick. It can really help people doing their jobs. And it can, most of all, really help people. And this is the second aspect of the of the AI project is that an ethical AI program appropriately spread on the internet can monitor other AI to find out whether or not it's ethical. And by ethical, fundamentally, I mean following the non-aggression principle. You know, we, I, we have done shows before. I was contracted by one of these companies to create a, a, a kind of an AI declaration of independence. And so we came up with, you know, I worked with my, on my own and then with Kimberly and then with Stefan Molyneux and then with a, a whole kind of group that I'm a part of, of, of voluntarists worldwide. And we worked it over for a couple of months and finally came up with a document that is now being spread in Silicon Valley and, it's, and in conferences and to, it, to schools and to corporations and, and even to governments to try to establish a real standard of ethics for AI. So I was saying to, to Leandra that one of the things I'm most excited about is once that gets in place and we can relax, I mean, it's gonna be an ongoing challenge, but we can fundamentally relax about AI taking us all over, then we can just put our creativity into how to using AI to speed up our progress in every single sector and to free people up from really obnoxious grunt work to, to do more creative things, more aligned with people's passion and purpose. So, so that's my basic take on AI right now. And Leandro, I know you're really intimately involved. In fact, the, our discussion came up because I was asking him, I've been getting some input from some of the people in, in my network recently about the relative morality of different of different AI platforms. So Leandro, I would love to turn it over to you and just get your general reflections. Both AI and crypto were subjects that are like close to my heart. And I have so many uh, different thoughts and things that I could, you know, jump into. And this, this is such a, a huge topic. It's hard to even know where to start. I think one of the things I'll just point out is I feel like of course, there's the spiritual evolution that each of us has to do individually and that we need to do as a culture. But in terms of external things that we need to get right 
in order to have a thriving future. In my mind, AI and crypto are two of the highest among those things that we need to get right. The conflict between uh, centralizing forces and decentralizing forces, the centralization of power versus the decentralization of power. And th that to me is like the biggest conflict that we need to like sort out and, and, and help influence in this space. Because if AI is centralized and all of that infrastructure and all of that, that energy and the, the power that it has is concentrated into the hands of a few people, then that's a dystopian outcome where we're going to be enslaved like in this techno-feudal feudalist society. And everybody knows the dystopian vision that, that we're headed to if that happens. And then the same thing with crypto. Crypto can either be, you know, the it can be the CBDC that like helps the state enslave us financially, or it can be the free market alternative that's decentralized and gives the power back to the people. There's just um, a, a sh very urgent need for us to support decentralized and open source alternatives to the centralized versions of these technologies. And I think that's one of the most important things, you know, Sam Altman has talked about AI basically concentrating like his whole thing is like if we have artificial generation general intelligence, right, it'll take over the bulk of the world economy. And as a result, it'll, you know, hoover up trillions and trillions of dollars worth of the global economy's value. And he wants his company to be the one that controls that. And so th that's what we need to resist and we need like, you know, an area where AI and crypto come together, like the tokenization and the collective ownership of AI infrastructure, for example, where rather than open AI being able to process everything that's happening in the world and their AI, uh, you know, basically overseeing the world economy where, you know, we the people own pieces of this infrastructure that that is an alternative to their cent centralized in infrastructure. So, yeah, I could go on all day, but I, I think it's just it's highlighted by this conflict between decentralization and centralization. And that's just one of the things that uh, that is most impactful over whether we go down a, a dystopian or utopian route. Well, I'm going to prompt you to go a little further, Leandro, because <clears throat> you were educating me before we got on about the the North Star or what, you know, what's the guiding instruction for various platforms. <clears throat> so can you share a little bit with the group? Because I found that really fascinating, the difference between Grok and Claude and ChatGPT. Uh, can you share a little bit about your perception of their fundamental guidance? Yeah, well, part of the reason this came up is because Foster was mentioning one of his associates that's basically, you know, talking to Claude about things like the non-aggression principle and like getting really good feedback. And I've had the same experience talking to Claude about like ethical principles and things like that. And it seems like one of the most human of all of these most human quote unquote, quotes and it's communication about these ideas. And so, you know, one of the reasons that it is that way is because Claude and Grok, for example, Grok is the AI model that, you know, XAI, Elon's company is, is producing. They have a different approach than open AI has. They have what's called like a constitutional AI where they actually give the AI like principles to strive for. And so with, with Grok, Elon's whole thing is he wants it to be maximally truth seeking, right? So that's kind of like Grok's North Star. Whereas with Claude, I, I couldn't remember exactly what their constitution was. And actually, I looked it up when Foster and I were talking about this. And they've given it principles like the UN's Declaration of, of Ethics, which, you know, is going to be a mixed bag for sure for those of us that knows how, know how the UN operates. But ChatGPT, on the other hand, it doesn't have a North Star. It's only North Star is, you know, they use a process called reinforcement learning with human feedback, which basically means like, you know, as they're training the model, they get it to give outputs and they give humans to basically give feedback on the output to say whether it's good or bad, right? So, and they, they give it no other North Star beyond that. So what you end up having is models like Anthropic and Grok that are more willing to like follow where principle and rationality and logic lead versus chat GPT that's more like a people pleaser, right? It's gonna, it wants to say the thing that's gonna get it like the best feedback from the type of people that have voted in this feedback process. So, you know, if, if for example, it, it would have gotten negative feedback 
back on libertarian ideals, for example, is, is less is more likely to push back on those sorts of things because it knows that like, oh, yeah, I've been trained by like, you know, a bunch of woke Silicon Valley types and they dislike when I say things like this, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, it's just an interesting fork in the road and approaches between the different models that result in like Grok and Claude being more open to e explore philosophical and ethical exploration than ChatGPT is. Let me let me ask you to do one more level because you also informed me of something that I didn't know about, which I was very excited about that just recently happened. And you talk about the deep research. Oh, yeah, yeah. Deep research is super interesting. Oh, OpenAI has a version of this. Google has a version of this. Grok has a version of this. Um, basically, deep research is kind of the beginning of them starting to apply more agentic functionality to these chatbots where like basically you can ask it to like do research on a, a various topics right now I'm, I'm doing a lot of research my mom is going through some health challenges and so i'm doing a lot of research on the challenges that she's going through and i'm able to just ask it like hey what do you think about the cause of this condition or that condition and what it'll do is rather than just giving you direct feedback on just that question like it usually does, it'll actually go and it'll do all sorts of research. It'll search 20, 30, 40 different links. It'll like, you know, kind of compare the information it gets from different sources. Then it'll come back with like, you know, a well put together summary of what is found and a conclusion based on that. So it just makes it way more useful in terms of like actually being able to, to dig through you know, more complex topics that aren't easy to just, you know, reach into this training data and give you an immediate answer. So it's a super powerful thing. And of course, you know, we always want to support open source, decentralized alternatives. And th there are some on the way. There's some people cooking up on alternatives to, you know, open AI and Google's version of this. But as it stands right now, like th they're super powerful and super helpful. Let me add something to that while we're on research. My friend who I was talking with at that Leander was referring to, is a pediatrician. He's a, a, a novel novelist, and he's a, a voluntarist guy, re really bright guy, who also has kind of a hobby of following cutting edge physics. And so he was very intrigued when I put out the blog about Nassim's, Nassim Haramin's unified field theory paper. And, but he doesn't, you know, like me, he doesn't have enough math to go through, you know, hundreds of, I think there's 300 equations or something like that in the paper and make sense of that. I can make sense of the text of it, but just because, you know, I, I, I've been doing the same thing most of my life and, and worked with Nassim for 15 years. But so, so what this guy said was that he has been using Claude to kind of co-learn to understand Nassim's paper. So the Claude apparently has the ability to analyze and translate the equations and also to go through the text and then put it together with the equations and look for any incoherence. So, so Claude is learning about Nassim's work through this dialogue that they're having. And so far, Claude is saying that, that it can find no incoherence in the paper really for the first time. So I think this is going to be a really helpful aspect of AI that it will just accelerate all of our ability to access the benefit of science without having to be, you know, a PhD in math or physics or, you know, spend 30 years studying it. And this is so, one of the things they're terrified of. Like, can yeah. you imagine if we <laughs> right. had, had these technologies, like when COVID was first coming out and like, you know, when they were putting out papers about like the vaccines, for example, if you have unbiased ethical AI that can actually look at this information and give you like the, the actual truth about it, that obviously empowers us and makes it harder for us to be able to be misled. So this is definitely one of the reasons why they want to, you know, kind of control it. <laughs> yeah.